I was recently interviewed on Concrete Podcast, brilliant YouTube channel, and that got me to watch hours and hours of the guys on Concrete interviewing Matt Cox. Now, if you're not familiar with Matt Cox, he has become a YouTube sensation, one of the FBI's most wanted fraudsters. And it's the way Matt tells his story. He's got this unique charisma. It doesn't look like a you know, big, tattooed, muscly convict guy. He's just got this unique uh, charisma. And he tells his story, and it is like compulsively watchable. Once I started watching it, I thought, all right, I'll dip into this. <laughs> like hours later, I'm like, what is going to happen next? So I'm absolutely delighted to have Matt on the podcast here today. And you've got a book coming out, Matt. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, I do. I have Shark in the Housing Pool, which is my book. And it's actually available right now on Amazon. And it's it's my story. It's basically my story up to prison. And it kind of gives you a quick uh, recap of what happened in prison. But it's maybe a chapter. But the bulk of the book, 95% of it is my, uh, I guess, crime spree, you'd call it. <laughs> What a hell of a spree it was. And the link to the book is in the description box below this video, as are links to any of our Matt's stuff that you wanted to put down there. So how did it start, Matt? Uh, gosh, you know, I mean, you know, you know, I, you know, I've written like I've written a story just like you've written, you know, several stories. And um, I mean, it started with, you know, I was a dyslexic kid who struggled in school and, Eventually ended up getting a degree and uh, that was pretty much, I hate to say this, useless. It was in fine arts. <laughs> There's just, what am I going to do with that? Uh, and so I ended up having a girlfriend and I was, or I was broke, struggling, you know, uh, was not making it. And I ended up giving, having a girlfriend who went to work for a subprime lender and she said you know you're just you're made for this you're absolutely made for this you've gotta you gotta do this and so i really just stopped working completely and went to work for this lender and they kind of they sent they sent you off and trained you and i came back and i started uh, originating mortgage loans and i think my very first loan was uh i don't think i know my very first loan was fraud my very first loan my my, the manager of the, of the branch office I worked for, for a company called Eagle Lending, she looked through the file. She took one piece of paper out and laid it to the side and said, it's perfect, except there's a 30, this person was 30 days late on their mortgage. And you're, it's a deal killer. You're done. It's not going to close. I mean, I got, I got Ford motor cars looking for my truck. I'm a month or two behind on my mortgage. Uh, my credit cards are getting cut up. I mean, it was, you know, it's bad. So it's like either I fix this or I'm moving back in with my parents. And she told me, hey, look, she said, I said, man, that's fraud. I, I could get in trouble. And she goes, no, the worst that'll happen if they catch it is, is that they'll fire you. You can always blame the, uh, the, the client, say you didn't know. She goes, you're not, nobody's calling the FBI. I was like, okay, so. I whited it out, I and mean, this is my manager told me to do it. I, I whited it out, I stuck it in the file, sweat bullets for five or six days, the loan closes, they cut me a check for $3,500. <laughs> I mean, that was a lot of money. That was 50, it was 20, almost 20 years ago. <laughs> that caught up all my bills. So very quickly, like I closed like four loans like the first month, then it was six, then it was eight, then it was 10, then they make me a branch manager. Then they're got me training people. I mean, it's, and very quickly it, it escalates. It's like everything, you know, it starts small and it just, before you know it, if you walked into my office, you know, with a pulse, I, I was getting you alone. I'm changing <laughs> W2s. I'm changing pay stubs. I'm making fake banks. I'm making thank, uh, uh, thank, uh, bank statements. I mean, anything you needed. I was going to, I could, I was going to manufacture it because it was going right through, everything was going through underwrite. Even when they caught it, even when they caught me, eventually I ended up opening my own mortgage company. Even the times I got caught, and I don't mean got caught like with a, a little $200,000 loan. I mean like we've closed seven or eight loans 
maybe 10 loans with a company and they've got $2 million worth of bad loans and they stumble across it, the bank, the president would just call me and say, look, man, what's going on? Well, you know, I say, look, I don't, I don't know what happened. I don't know what this broker did that works for me. Cause I all, like I said, I opened my own place and I was like, I don't know what he did, but we need to work this out. Cause I don't have $2 million to cut you a check. So, you know, and he would say, look, you know, let's, uh, I'm going to sell the paper. So he's now going to sell the, the bad paper. So he's going to sell at the household bank. And if it comes back on me, he goes, do me a favor and uh, you'll help me get, tell me you'll help me get rid of the loans. I was like, of course, absolutely. What am I going to say? No, you're on your own. So, you know, I don't want him calling the FBI. So it ends up, it, it just escalates to the point where eventually, you know, by this point I'm married, I've got a kid. Uh, I've, I've got 13, 14 brokers working for me. They're all committing fraud. And eventually a broker that used to work for me went and started her own company. And when she did, she did a bunch of fraudulent loans that came back on her. And the FBI came in, they indicted her and her husband. So they wore a wire on me because they knew my loans were fraudulent. They wore a wire on me and they ended up getting me indicted. And so I go in and I have, I hire this attorney. We, I plead guilty. I mean, I'm guilty. There's no, there's no getting around it. And I wasn't really, there was no chance I was going to go to prison. So, cause it, it was a minor, the charge they got me for was minor. It was lying on a, it was lying on a, like a mortgage application. It ended up being wire fraud. It's, it's a, it's kind of a, and there was no dollar loss. So I end up, accepting the I end up accepting the uh, uh, I take a plea I get three years probation but I can't own the mortgage company anymore so you know at that point at that point I I, I really should have <clears throat> I really should have gone out and gotten a job selling used cars or something but you know I didn't really know what else to do I don't have any didn't have any experience in anything else so I was getting a divorce, you know, basically my wife wiped me out. So I'm, I was just in a bad spot. And basically I could have moved home with mom and dad, but you know, I'm 30 something, you know, I'm like 30 years old. So what I did instead was I figured, okay, you can either go the legit method and struggle, or you can take it up a notch and you can try and pull off, like start pulling off like a major fraud instead of this kind of this gray this grayish area that I, I felt like it was a gray area. I'm changing a number here. Change, you know, I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to figure out how to just start flipping properties. I was already flipping them, but the problem with flipping properties is this. You buy these houses for 40 or $50,000. You put 20 in them, you sell them for a hundred. Your borrowers in these areas are shit borrowers. So they don't have good credit. They have bad job history, so they can barely get a loan. You usually have to give them their down payment. You have to pay their closing costs. You end up making $20,000, maybe $15,000, and it takes four months. So it's just not a lot of money for the headache unless you're doing multiple properties. And basically, you end up being a glorified construction worker. So, And I didn't want to be a construction worker. So what I did was I figured my problem is not buying and fixing up the houses. It's the borrowers. So if I could figure out how to manufacture my own borrowers, then that would be a plus. They wouldn't complain about their interest rate. They, I could make all the payments. And then I let the property go into foreclosure. So I figured out how to get, how to get social security. Our credit bureau is based on social security numbers. Um, I'm sure you have some kind of a, a similar, uh, similar uh, system in place, but so I figured out how to get social security to issue social security numbers to children that don't exist. So I'm, I'm getting them to make social security numbers. Then I'm getting three secured credit cards and I'd make the payments. Well, in six months you had like 720 credit scores, you know, these amazing credit scores and the person doesn't exist. <laughs> so I would go and I would buy these houses. And the other problem was this one, of course, I now don't have to fix up the house. I can buy it for 40 and I don't have to fix it up because the, nobody's gonna ever live there. 
Well, the other thing was getting the appraisals high enough. Like you really want to get a, an appraisal high. How do you do that? It's kind of, you know what it's like? Since you were in stocks, right? So it's like a pump and dump scheme. I went out and I started manufacturing sale prices at 200,000, one, I'm buying houses for 40 and 50,000. And I'm, manu I'm recording the value of the sales price at 200,000. I was dating a girl at the title company. She told me how to do it. So now I bought the house. It looks like my fake borrower bought a house for 200,000. He really bought it for 40. I was then able to go back to the bank, refinance the house for, that was now worth two, 200,000. They'd lend him 160 or 180,000 because he has perfect credit. He bought it for 40. Maybe I put 10 in it, borrowed 160. I just made $100,000 minimum. I'd make three or four payments. I'd let the property go into foreclosure. So the name of the borrowers, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned this, is, uh, and I'm sure you saw the show, is I named my borrowers like James Red, Michael White, Lee Black, William Blue, David Silver, Brandon Green. So it was green, black, blue, red. So it was, I was a big fan of Quentin Tarantino and I'd seen the movie uh, Reservoir Dogs. I didn't name anybody Mr. Pink. So <laughs> what ends up happening is each guy bought about four or five houses, borrowed about a million dollars in each guy's name. We would make about $600,000 per person. And I think and towards the end, we had the FBI said I had borrowed 11 and a half million in these guys in my phantom borrowers names or they call them now synthetic identities. Like after I did it, when I went to prison, it started becoming like a thing. So they have, it has its own name now. So, so these synthetic identities would buy all these houses and we'd make some payments and they'd go into foreclosure. And then of course the banks start looking. Now the banks start coming around. They start sending investigators out to try and talk to you. They start sending um, collection notices. So I would, I would, I retyped an article in the, uh, in like the Tampa Tribune about about a car crash, where where the one of the one of the people in the car crashes was life flighted to Tampa General Hospital. So I t put I would put the name of my guy in it, reprint it on newsprint, cut it up so it looks like it's on newsprint, cut it all up, and then mail it to the collection agencies and the banks, saying from this guy's imaginary sister, saying that my brother was in a car accident. I know he's behind on the mortgage. You might as well take the house. Even if the doctors say, even if he comes out of the coma, he'll never work again. And they would stop calling. They'd stop sending letters in. They'd stop coming by. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was really, it was, a, I mean, this is going to sound horrible. It was a perfect fucking scheme, bro. It, worked, it went years. I went years. Uh, I think I was only caught, I was caught one time by South Star Bank. They caught one of my guys and realized that this it's complete fraud. I, re I remember the broker came to me and said, look, the underwriter, the account executive is saying that the guy doesn't exist. The bank is on to it. So I ended up having to call the bank as this guy and say, look, this is who I am. Let, you know, I understand that I, I haven't made a payment. I'm, I'm putting it in the mail. They're like, no, no, it's way past that. We figured out the SOCH. We figured out that your driver's license was never issued. We figured out this. We figured out that. And I ended up convincing them to allow me to simply pay them back. <laughs> Let me just pay you back. Because otherwise, if they were like, oh, well, when we foreclose on the property, we'll get our money back. Like, no, 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 you don't seem to understand your property's worth 40 grand. You lent me 150. So they go back and they look at the appraisal and I explain to them what I did. And they, their, their attitude totally changed. They were like, okay, now Mr. Cox, let's, or Mr. You know, Mr. Whatever his name was. This was a, this wasn't one of the, one of the colored guys. This was one of the, um, this guy's was, I think this was Alan Duncan. He was like, Mr. Duncan, let's, let's, you know, we can work this out. So they let me pay him back. Never called the FBI. 